let me state you know, right away that uh, I firmly believe that most of us own and drive vehicles that we do not really need. Uh, I really think that the future is one that is based on a different model of mobility based on uh, shared uh, mobility, shared vehicles. Uh, this is a future that presents a huge uh, you know, market opportunity, uh, which we'll run, look at some numbers. It can be estimated on several trillion dollars uh, in the US alone per year, but also a big societal change in the way that we think of mobility for ourselves and for our goods. So what do we actually mean uh, by self-driving or autonomous vehicles? Level zero, of course, is just your old style, you know, <laughs> Ford Model T kind of <laughs> in automation that is no automation. <laughs> Uh, there is something level one is a little bit more sophisticated, you know, things like ABS or, um, you know, cruise control, you know, this like a single function that, uh, that get, you know, automated to, uh, to in, in improve safety uh, and reduce the workload of the driver. Then there are these two levels. Right? So level two is essentially two or more of these functions that are combined. Level three, the car is taking over control, but the car relies on the fact that the driver will be able to take over control given, when necessary, given a warning and some comfortably sufficient time for the driver to regain control of the vehicle. Level four is, is the level where the cars, the car is actually taking control over, you know, completely on the car and does not rely on a human being able to take over in case something goes wrong. I really think that there are very severe limitations on actually what kind of safety you can provide with level two and three. At any time you have the human in the loop or on the loop or the human involved in any kind of critical way in the system, you're looking for trouble, okay? Or actually the problem is much easier than people may think. And it saddens me as an aerospace engineer to see this happening because in the aerospace community, we have known for decades that this could, was a problem, that as soon as we started introducing automation and you know, autopilots and all things like that, you know, oh, well, this will be, make air transportation safer. Uh, no, no, uh, wait a minute, that's not the case. Typically, those solutions involve highly trained professionals, pilots, airline pilots, right, who keep their training current. If the car is level two or three, requires you to be ready to intervene, well, I mean, you cannot sleep during that time, right? You cannot watch a movie, you cannot you know, do your email or work during that time. So really to, to really get that value, you had to go to le all the way to level four. Same thing for car sharing. You need to get all the way to level four. The way I see it, level four is really what we need, is really the only point where we'll actually need to cap, we'll be able to capture the benefits of this technology. Anything less, it's nice, it's convenient, you can brag about it with your friends, but that's about it, okay? And in a sense, the game-changing feature of autonomous cars is the, really their ability to drive themselves when there is nobody on board. This is really what is completely different from what we have today. Let's assume for a moment now that we can actually have a fleet of hundreds of thousands of these autonomous cars that actually drive around they're able to drive people from point A to point B without killing anybody in the process, okay? What would you do with them, right? And how good of a service could they provide to the general public? With a fleet of 300,000 vehicles in Singapore, what we can do is we, we can uh, ensure, to, we can provide mobility to everybody in the country with at most an expected waiting times of about 15, 20 minutes at rush hour. Okay, that is comparable to what you had to wait nowadays for a, for a taxi or some other means of transportation. 300,000 cars will be sufficient to provide mobility to everybody. What does it mean? How does that compare to the number of vehicles in Singapore at the time? The number of vehicles in Singapore at the time of passenger vehicles was about 800,000. So what we are seeing here is that you can reduce the number of passenger vehicles circulating in the city by a factor of 60%. What do you do with the 60%? Now you can take, in Singapore, you can take half a million cars, sell them to some other country, Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, wherever, you know, he's around you, and get back all the space. You know, typically in a city, you account for at least, you know, three, four parking spaces for each vehicle. 
that is you know, a million and a half, two million uh, parking spaces in a city like Singapore. You know, that's enormous value, right? Economic, but also enormous value for the people who live in the city, right? So you can transform all these spaces and give them back and not use them to store metal and rubber, but give them back to people.